It was collegiate and chatty and uh, it was a lot of good humour uh, disguising the agony of trying to bring those 13 books down to six. You would think that a couple would fall off quite easily. No, uh, it was um, um, a job of work. We are earning our coffee. The books that you've loved um, deepen and resonate more. They lodge themselves further into your heart. And then books that didn't yield to you in the second or third reading suddenly start to yield. Um, and that's partly because you're talking to these amazingly clever judges who are illuminating the books for you, but you're also understanding the books in a wider context of all the other things that you're reading. There were books that I liked more, partly from a new acquaintance with the book, read in a slightly more gentle circumstances, but also from the comments of my fellow judges in the previous meeting, and just growing maturity. There's something about the process of rereading a book where sometimes you like it more than you thought and sometimes you like it less. And that definitely happened. There were occasions where judges had discovered on a second read that a book was even deeper and more interesting than they'd realized. Reading a lot of these books for the second time, I was surprised to find how much I was able to get out of them again and how much more deeply I appreciated them, especially some of the more detailed and historically oriented books. To, to go back to those, you realize how much is packed in and what you've missed when you read it just once. We had a lot of surprise uh, responses to the books in the room. Uh, there were people who were championing books who then came in and said, well, it was all right, but I don't really want to fight for it. And the exact reverse, people who had you know, been rather reluctant about certain titles who came in raving about them. And it's, it's, it's in the nature of books themselves that we tend only to read things once, but an awful lot of what is written does repay rereading and re-rereading. And there isn't much of a culture of rereading at the moment. And I think that's a shame. The reason that people are reading more non-fiction is partly due to the just sheer strength of the writing skills that we see but also in a world where we're bombarded, and I know from my job, but with sound bites, 24 hour news cycle, there's a yearning to understand, to find out what's happening in the world around us. And I think that's really important. In the last 20 years, there have obviously been so many seismic changes in the world and in our urgent need to understand and decode that world. And a lot of that stuff has histories that we hadn't really thought about before. There is a general mood to embrace non-fiction as a way of unpicking a world which is otherwise fragmented and fractured by the way we acquire news now, for instance through social media and through um, rumour <laughs> and uh, you know through our friends Twitter feeds. Um, Non-fiction is serving a greater social purpose now, I think, than it has ever done before. But I think it's a testament to the writers that we're not running around like headless chickens all writing the same kind of book, that we're continuing to explore different ways, not only of different bits of the world to write about, but different ways of writing about it. The interest in non-fiction comes from a yearning to learn, that's what nonfiction is for me. It's about understanding somebody else's mode of understanding, the research they've done, the sources they've marshaled, the truth that they want to tell, and to see their vision of the world as, as they cast it. I can't remember a time when there was such a range of authors who could approach nonfiction in such an inventive, exciting way, um, as well as writing these books, which are very, very deeply researched. Being involved in the Bailey Gifford Prize for Nonfiction makes you obviously assess the genre. Um, and the difficult thing is, is that you start to understand that the genre has no fixed poles, that so much of it can have a fictional quality, so much of it is evocative, so much of it is scholarly and researched. And so many of the books that we're longlisting and shortlisting now tilt the genre in particular ways, they bust the genre. So yes, the process makes you reevaluate what nonfiction is. Usually I read nonfiction that I feel is somehow related uh, in one way or another, you know, closely to sort of current events and to politics and to the things that I cover in my day job working for a newspaper. What I've loved about judging this prize, and I feel like what's actually changed my relationship to nonfiction is it's, you know, 
propelled me and forced me to read so many books I would not otherwise have picked up about science topics, about sort of like memoir and, and human issues, um, uh, about philosophy. And I feel like my appetite for nonfiction has grown tremendously because of judging this. I differ from a lot of the judges in that I think that nonfiction is supposed to be different from fiction and the two should be radically different with radically different aesthetics. Um, and in this, um, I met with a certain amount of opposition uh, because there are um, judges who adore the way that the tools of fiction can be applied to nonfiction. Now, to an extent, this debate is rather like two bald men fighting over a comb. I mean, you can make arguments both ways. And I didn't expect that to be um, as much of an issue as it became. There is a serious discussion to be had about whether um, non-fiction has its own aesthetic. Having now read a hundred odd books, some of them several times over, I obviously don't ever want to read a book again. But having selected this amazing shortlist, I also know what writing can do, what non-fiction can do in the world, and how it can lodge itself in your brain and your body and your feelings. And yeah, I think it increases your appetite for this incredible genre. A lot of the stuff that we covered in the books I would want to read anyway and would not have had any excuse for. So I think I will now go back to my normal civilian life of not having enough time to read non-fiction, but it certainly confirmed my sense that it's something I would like to, like to be spending a lot more time doing. It's going to be a while before I pick up a gigantic biography again, um, but what I've loved is learning about subjects which I know very little about. I'm someone from an arts background to read more science books, so I definitely will be more attracted to non-fiction books in the future. One of the reasons I decided that I wanted to chair the Bailey Gifford Prize was because I tend to read an awful lot more novels than non-fiction. So for me, it's been a real journey of discovery, looking at the range of non-fiction books out there, but also the kind of imaginative skills that authors bring to their subjects and the way that they're able to weave in narratives which come from real life make them very special. The process of judging this has reminded me why I love non-fiction so much. I've loved non-fiction ever since I was a child. I used to just devour history books um, from quite a young age. Um, but it's been one of those years, 2020, when so many of us have felt completely trapped inside our own four walls and inside our own heads. And what judging the Bailey Gifford has reminded me is that the best non-fiction has this incredible power to take your take you outside of your own head and give you a fresh perspective and this sense of all these different human lives. I think I'd never sat down in such a programmatic way to think about the criteria of non-fiction as I had before doing this prize, um, uh, uh, but it certainly reinforced the ways in which non-fiction is usefully dis distinct from fiction. What I've loved about judging this prize, and I feel like what's actually changed my relationship to nonfiction is it's, you know, propelled me and forced me to read so many books I would not otherwise have picked up about science topics, about sort of like memoir and, and human issues, um, uh, about philosophy. And I feel like my appetite for nonfiction has grown tremendously because of judging this. I feel like I, I have a better sense of sort of what's possible in a non-fiction book than I did before. What this list will do will give people a chance to discover books that they won't necessarily have seen, that they might not have seen reviewed, and there are some real treasures in there. I can say f with some confidence that I wouldn't have heard of them. I mean, not, not naming any names. I mean, some of them have already had notable success of one kind or another, but I would say at least half of the shortlist I, as a prospective reader, would have been massively benefited from hearing about them. I mean, from, from them being brought to my attention uh, via that, that avenue. So the same would go for the, for the long list. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a crowded market, any, any, any book market is. You know, there's so many books published. But um, to find six books and say, these are the key half a dozen non-fiction books according to us, you know, acknowledging that there were other books that we loved, of course, uh, is, yeah, that's, an, that's an, an invaluable practice. 
it's really hard not to have your own prejudices in the things that you read. There are so many things out there in the publishing world, in your bookshops, in your libraries, and we filter out the things that we know speak to us and we all have our own preferences. I love a book about the Beatles or a 19th century Japanese woman. But I didn't know that I could love a book about the idea of the brain. Um, and that's what I think a, a, a prize like the Bailey Gifford does, is that it shows you the range and depth of the writing that's out there. I'm tempted to use that old Hollywood line, you'll laugh, you'll cry. Um, it really is an extraordinarily uh, varied list. There are books which appear, at least on the surface, to be purely entertaining, although uh, I believe we've chosen well and uh, the books that seem quite light actually have um, hidden depths to them. The shortlist just shows what incredible breadth and depth there is in current non-fiction, which can take you anywhere from Poltergeist in the 1930s to the Beatles in the 1960s to the life of an apparently ordinary woman in 19th century Japan to the nature of consciousness itself. It's hard to describe this shortlist in a few words because it's so disparate. Every book is so sort of singular, but what they're united by and what every book on this shortlist is united by is this, uh, this, this way of making coherent narrative and telling you sort of a, a rich, propulsive story around these, these real events. This shortlist, I think, is fantastic. I'm already planning to buy all the books on it for people's Christmas presents. And I think, even though there are very different subjects, what they share is a real freshness of approach and some absolutely beautiful writing.